Hello. Hello and welcome to the second River Film Session at EU Green Week. I hope uh, everybody can see the slide and uh, see the screen with the speaker. Welcome to the second session. Um, we just had one hour of uh, short films, feature film and panel discussion on free flowing rivers. Of course, this second session is also on free flowing rivers. Uh, the focus here now is on dam removal and the challenge of removing barriers and dams from our river ecosystems. Someone said in the, in the session two, two this morning, it's about protecting and reconnecting and protecting is more important as we are uh, protecting systems that have a high quality, reconnecting something that was destroyed or disconnected is much more difficult. Nonetheless, it needs both. And we try to link in those two sessions with the films and the discussion, those two challenges uh, of uh, river conservation. And uh, again, I would like to start with a quick thank you to the European Commission for hosting this event and to EEB for co-hosting this and to all participants and filmmakers, of course, uh, who have contributed to the first session and will now to the second. Um, in a way, you get here a online version of River Film Fest, which is a format that uh, we've been presenting in cities throughout Europe, Berlin, Dusseldorf, Munich, uh, but also Szczecin in Poland, Helsinki in Finland. Um, we're combining film screenings with expert discussions to bring people together in a, a different setting than a regular conference, but nonetheless, we want to have a serious discussion. Essentially, we believe it's important to change the, converse, cons <laughs> change the conversation about rivers. Uh, freshwater biodiversity need, needs more attention, free-flowing rivers need more attention, and this conference gives me uh, the confidence that the conversation is in fact changing. Freshwater life is receiving more attention in the EU biodiversity strategy. The free flow of rivers is more and more recognized as the essential property driving uh, the dynamics of the system. And we had a speaker from the Blue Heart of Europe, Save the Blue Heart of Europe campaign in the first session. This campaign really, I think, changed the view uh, that many people have on rivers and on wild rivers uh, in on our continent. So um, for this session, I would first of all like to introduce the panelists. Uh, we have with us Hans Stjelstra from the European Commission DG Environment, Clean Water Unit. Hello, Hans. Hello. <laughs> We have uh, Eve Silva with us from Wetlands International um, and uh, OPSOL representing Dam Removal Europe. Hello, Eve. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. With us, Professor uh, Clement Tochner uh, from the Austrian Science Fund and also represent, representing the Alliance for Freshwater Life. Hello. <laughs> good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hello, and uh, we have with us as a special guest from the US, David Morick, uh, Senior Director of Wild and Scenic Rivers at American Rivers. Hello, David. Good to be with you. To you, thank you. And uh, as in the first session, Michael Bender will, will co-moderate. Uh, first, maybe one last word about myself. I am representing Living Rivers Foundation uh, and we are a member of the EB, and I'm a member of the Water Working Group. Uh, I work at IGB Berlin, which is Leibniz Institute of Freshwater Ecology and Inland Fisheries. And my co-moderator is Michael Bender, who's also in the EB Water Working Group, and we will see him in a second. Hello, Michael. Hello, good evening to everyone. Welcome to joining our session. Hey, thank you. Um, again, we have Three short films, actually they are trailers or teasers for longer films that are online or will be produced. Um, then we have a discussion and the final film is a full documentary of 25 minutes about the stunning removal of the two dams in the Elwa River in Washington State on the West Coast. And um, we also would like to make a connection 
to a conference that was held last week as a partner event, uh, Rivers as Lifelines for Nature and People. I think we can make a connection with those films to the very important discussions that are happening at the conference. But without further ado, I would like to start uh, the screening of uh, three short films. Thank you. Der Lachs war ein Kommerzfisch. Ne? Die Lachsfischerei war eine kommerzielle Fischerei. Die deutschen Ströme zählten zu den besten Lachsflüssen überhaupt. Und das ist eben durch den gewissenlosen Umgang mit den Ressourcen in Deutschland vollständig verloren gegangen. Riesige Feuersäulen erhoben sich über Schweizer Halle bei Basel. Der Versuch, die Fischarten zu etablieren, die hier eigentlich heimisch waren. Ich finde, dass es auch ein Stück weit unsere Verantwortung ist, weil wir als Menschen haben den Lebensraum zerstört. Und deswegen sind wir auch, denke ich, dafür verantwortlich, das wieder in Ordnung zu bringen. Wir können eben auch aufzeigen, dass es prinzipiell möglich ist, den Lachs wieder anzusiedeln. Und wenn die Fische die Laichgründe erreichen, dann funkt's. Wir tun diese Arbeit nicht nur für den Lachs, er ist die Galionsfigur, unter der sich auch jeder und jede etwas vorstellen kann. Das ist dann halt toll, wenn man sieht, dass der schon, schon mal da war. Das ist für uns auch ein Zeichen dass wir vernünftig mit den Fischen umgehen, dass die also das schaffen, nochmal wiederzukommen. Varmaan oma semmoinen ympäristöherääminen syntyi silloin, kun tajusin, että Kemioen lohi on tapettu sukupuuttoon ihan silkkaa välinpitämättömyyttä. Siirtykää tekin vesivoimaan, vesivoimaa, päästötöntä energiaa. Nämähän on näitä jokapäiväisiä mainoksia, jotka me kohtaamme. Suomessa, jossa ollaan äärimmäisen tarkkoja siitä, että mitään ei sai mainostaa niin kuin harhaan johtavilla argumenteilla, niin vesivoiman markkinoiminen täysin valheellisilla argumenteilla onkin yhtäkkiä sallittua. Vesivoima on ollut Suomessa tabu. Ja se on osin edelleenkin sitä. Sen verran provosoivat mua siinä tilanteessa, että yksi poika kävi vetäsemässä housut alas ja pyllisti riistakameraa, niin mä ajattelin, että nyt... Nyt on kyllä pakko lähteä. On liian pitkään pyöritty tämmöisessä munakana tilanteessa, että ei kanta purkaa patoja tai tehdä kalateita, koska siellä ei ole lisätymisalueita. Niin tästä yksinkertaista ongelmasta täytyy päästä eroon. Siis päästä eroon sillä, että aloittaa vaan jostain. Tärkeintä on, että pyörät pyörii. Turbiini tässä tapauksessa. Euroja syntyy jollekin. Me menetetään kaikkien kansainvälisten kalastusmatkailijoiden potentiaaliset matkailutulot meidän naapurimaille. Jos meillä ei kalakanta toimi, ei meillä ole tämä minkäännäköistä kalastusmatkailua. Meille jää vain haitat. Tyhjät talot ja suuri työttömyys. Tämä ennakkotapauksen luonne on aika iso ja tästä asiasta tähän voimalaitos ihmiset ovat aika hiljaa. Kun näitä vesialueita ostettiin, niin nämä ostajat kaato kannusta vettä lasiin ja sanoivat, että he ostaa vain tätä vesivoimaa.
¿Has pensado qué pasaría si bloqueas las venas de tu cuerpo? Te darías cuenta de que no podrías vivir mucho tiempo. Es lo mismo que pasa con el gran organismo que es este planeta. No podemos seguir bloqueando sus ríos. ¿Qué hacemos con los miles de presas, azudes, cruces de caminos y otras barreras que ya no sirven para nada? ¿Las explotamos estilo Hollywood? Sí, algunas sí, claro, otras no. Pero a la larga es lo mismo, el río fluye y la vida fluye. Mi nombre es Pau, tal cual. Ni Paola, ni Paula, solo Pau. Soy ingeniera forestal especializada en restauración de ecosistemas y más en concreto en diseño de escalas para peces y demolición de presas. Trabajo para Wolfish Migration Foundation como coordinadora del Día Mundial de la Migración de los Peces. Cuando estuve hace unos años en Estados Unidos con mi mentora Lara Wildman, aprendí que esto existía, que podíamos demoler los obstáculos de los ríos y mi vida cambió. Conocí gente en todo el mundo que también se planteaba la misma pregunta. ¿Cómo recuperamos los ríos? Y bueno, ya somos muchos. A héroes luchando por los ríos en todo el mundo, a todas horas. Y muchas represas desapareciendo, devolviendo la vida a los ríos. Y ahora en que estoy, me encuentro en un viaje alrededor del mundo para conocer estos héroes de los ríos y poder contarte su historia. Creo que empezaré a llamarles los cazadores de represas. So welcome back to our next round of river talks. And I would just like to ask our guests if there's anyone to who wants to, to reflect on the movies. So if this should not be the case for the moment, you can build in your reflections within your contributions and um I was just thinking about this um, event in that we river film event that we had in, in Berlin, and one of the greatest moments for me was the moment when I saw a South Korean lady uh, who were, who were doing a thesis, doing an interview with a North American river keeper, and that was the moment where I thought, okay, we bring together in, in Berlin uh, the people from all over the world to, to join and have the same uh, determination for the protection of our rivers. And I'm very proud and very glad that today here with us is this man that was interviewed in our river film event in Berlin, David Marek from American Rivers. And maybe, David, you can reflect a little bit on this uh, wild and scenic scheme that we have seen at the end of the last session and what does it mean to you in, in your work and what could it mean to Europe? Could you uh, share your uh, views on this, please? Thank you, Michael. And it's um, a pleasure to see you again and see many of the faces both in the film and on the panel that I've seen either in Berlin or in Sarajevo I think it's um, strong evidence of a movement that is growing internationally around um, the importance of free flowing rivers. And my organization, American Rivers, um, was founded uh, in 1973, shortly after the, the passage of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, which is a tool we use here in the US to protect high value rivers and keep them free flowing and protect their outstanding values. And, and, and you know, if I think of, um, rivers as a human body. And uh, our organization, when we were founded, um, realized that we were sort of at the tail end or the height, depending on how you view it, of the dam building era in the United States. And we've done, um, done quite a bit of damage to our free flowing rivers. And I think there wasn't a recognition of their values. And in terms of our organizational mission, our initial mission was to use this tool, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, to protect to protect rivers that were st still threatened by dams and diversions and other, other um, harmful development threats. And so we needed, we understood the need to, to stop the bleeding. But soon we realized that after some success and we continued to use this tool uh, across the, the nation, that it was also essential to 
look at dams that were obsolete or that were having uh, environmental harms. And, and so I actually view and our organization views free flowing rivers as, um, as the core goal, but the, the tools we use may vary depending sometimes dam removal. Um, and sometimes, um, uh, uh, we will try to protect a river, uh, before it is dammed. And so this continuum is important to understand because it, it actually is, I think, an evolution of our thinking. And in some, in many areas, you know, we've seen uh, 1,600 dams and divert and and barriers removed in the United States. About 1,200 of those have occurred since 1999, and the watershed moment was Edwards Dam removal. Um, and and we've we've continued to build and train a movement here. And what's interesting is there is a deep connection between use usage of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act and and dam removal because we're already seeing on rivers that are of high value and and the response we're seeing post dam removal we're actually applying the tool of wild and scenic to protect them after the dams are removed one one sh quick story um a, a, river, a small creek in Arizona named Fossil Creek it's the um it's the home of the Yavapai Apache uh, Nation, a uh, Native American tribe, and Fossil Creek is the um, is the they their creation story occurs at the headwaters in the springs that fed that feed Fossil Creek, and for nearly a hundred years, this creek was dammed, and we worked to with the tribe and others to remove the dam, and five years later, um, we worked with the tribe to protect the river permanently. And we've really seen an incredible response ecologically, recreationally, economically, even to the local community um, since removing the dam and the protections were put in place. And then just in, in closing, I just want to say, you know, this, I think it's critically important that we share with each other um, internationally uh, the tools, uh, what works and what doesn't work uh, in my time in, in uh, working with other colleagues across the world. I'm really seeing a greater intersection of, of uh, interests and values and ideas um, working in Chile, in Colombia, in Scandinavia, um, really looking at whether it's dam removal strategies or uh, river protection strategies. I think we have a lot uh, to do together. And I, again, thank you for, for having me. Thank you so much, uh, David. And you, you're talking about the permanent protection of, of rivers. And uh, so my question to to Hans Stielstra from uh, the European Commission would be, uh, could you already uh, figure out from our discussion today any ideas uh, when it comes to the legal proposals that might be um, already uh, candidates for, uh, to be uh, put in, uh, in in terms of permanent protection of our aquatic biodiversity. Uh, well, I was actually uh, asking uh, all of you that question, so I, I didn't really expect that I should be should be answering that question. Uh, you know, we have. Um, we have set ourselves uh, this collective target of uh, of uh, creating 25,000 kilometers of, of free flowing rivers. Um, and that uh, comes kind of on top of, of what we are doing under the legal under the legal framework that we have in place uh, in the EU, the, the, the water framework directive uh, in particular. Um, just to give you an idea, there's about uh, 1.2 million kilometers of, uh, of rivers in, in Europe. And uh, estimates are that there are between one, for every one and two kilometers of river, there's one, one obstacle, which could be a dam or, or a weir or something else. Um, so this 25,000 maybe is not uh, a, a huge number, but it, it is certainly for us, um, while it is not legally binding, I think it's it's kind of a cry for attention, if you like, and, and I think it has certainly worked like that. Uh, I think everyone here is that is here in the uh, 
um, in in the uh, in the webinar is um, is completely aware of it and doesn't need any convincing. But I think uh, within the the system that we usually function in, it it has certainly helped to uh, create more awareness for for that particular target. So we're quite happy uh, happy to have that. Um, maybe if 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 that's okay, I I will would like to mention three. Uh, ways in which we hope that we can actually uh, th that this target will materialize. Um, uh, the first one is that that our member states, all, all 27 of them, need to uh, produce uh, plans for for the river basins that they are responsible for. And in these in these river basin management plans, they should be writing what they plan to do with their river in order to. Uh, meet the requirements of the legislation and, and so we expect that that instrument as such will already push them to to think hard uh, how and why uh, sorry uh, where and how they they can be removing obstacles from from their rivers um, the second is that we we plan to help them by um, providing some clarity on on issues such as the metrics uh, around this question so what is actually uh, an obstacle, what, uh, what is a free-flowing river, what does that mean, uh, how do we count it, uh, what is our baseline, um, mm -hmm. but also issues about uh, around the priority, so what are the obstacles that we think that, that, that should be removed as a priority. Um, and then finally, of course, there is uh, a very significant amount of funding that uh, has in, in the past already been used, uh, a lot of it simply from the national uh, budgets, but there's also a lot of European money uh, that is uh, available for this, um, whether it's the LIFE program or the regional funds or, or, um, or research money. There are various uh, pots of money that, that can be used and that are used very much. Um, and finally, um, um, yeah, no, I just wanted to say that that as part of the um, the, the recovery um, plans that the the commission has has announced, um, there should be even more money available for for this type of activity. And there, I really hope that we can work hand in hand with the uh, the work on nature restoration. Um, uh, for which we have also said that there should be a certain amount of investment uh, available over the over the years to come. So those are a bit the, the concrete ways in which we would like to um, uh, support member states, uh, push member states a little bit in a friendly way to uh, achieve uh, achieve the target that we uh, that we have proposed. Thank you so much for sharing with us your uh, ideas to to implement also the um, funding and, and possibilities for also removing obstacles on our rivers to make them more free flowing. And now I would like to uh, hand the word over to Eve Silver from Wetlands International European Association, also dam removal. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, uh, the development and, and the situation in Europe regarding dam removal? Uh, yes, certainly. Thank you. Um, well, building on what Hans has just said about the, the estimated number of obsolete barriers in Europe uh, that we see, uh, around 100,000 uh, Dam Removal Europe, the partnership of several NGOs. They, we recognize this potential for uh, removing dams and restoring rivers to free flowing again. Um, and for, for the partnership uh, to be able to realize um, this, um, they have developed a new strategy for the coming decade in which we identify uh, five uh, types of activities that we want to uh, put in place in order to catalyze dam removal projects uh, in Europe uh, in the coming years. So uh, these five these five activities uh, are first of all to prioritize river basins and uh, dam removals in order to maximize the, their ecological and social impact. Uh, we want to kickstart dam removal projects on the ground so that we can actually show the clear benefits that that uh, come from removal uh, projects. 
thirdly, um, the partnership aims to engage in targeted communications so that we can reach out to the key decision makers and the key stakeholders uh, which should be involved in removing dams and restoring rivers. Uh, fourth, um, we want to improve the policy design and implementation uh, that the existing uh, imp uh, policies, including the Water Framework Directive, but also see how we can build on top of the existing policies, for example, through this new EU biodiversity strategy. Uh, and we want to do that by including dam removal as a viable river restoration measures. And like Hans mentioned before me, is an uh, intrinsic part of that is to mobilize the funds that are necessary for these projects. Uh, and the fifth type of action is that the Dam Removal Europe partners uh, aim to provide scalable models of dam removal um, so, that, uh, so that we can uh, uh, show again the ecological and the socioeconomic benefits, but also see how we can upscale this. And these, these activities are, are all uh, described in the Dam Removal Europe strategy for the coming decade. And I would really like to invite, in, also in the spirit of how Dam Removal Europe movement wants to work jointly with, with all the relevant stakeholders, is to invite everyone here to, to go to the damremoval.eu website and have a look at the strategy and see where they can uh, join in and how they can contribute also to, um, to restore rivers in Europe for all the reasons that have been mentioned uh, in this session and the one before the break. Thank you so much, Eve, for sharing uh, your experience and, and your priorities uh, for us and with us. And I think uh, our last main film uh, this evening will also show a little bit about the uh, possible outcomes of, of dam removal projects and what they could mean really for the restoration. Uh, the time is running, so I would uh, come to the next topic of this evening. It's not just dams that are, are a threat to our rivers, but we have, as we have seen in the previous session in this one movie on the Pripyat and the E40 water highway, it's also about navigation. And uh, maybe uh, Tobias could uh, shortly introduce a little bit on this uh, hydro, uh, not hydropower, but uh, inland navigation project that is uh, affecting the Oder River and, and other rivers uh, in Eastern Europe. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, Yes, it's, um, I think it's important to um, consider the, the wording, a free-flowing river um, is, is, of course, a river that has no barrier in it, but um, the free flow should also include the river dynamics uh, into the floodplain, as we heard from uh, Clement Tocqueville in the first session. And um, when we talk about dam removal, that is mostly hydropower. And the pressures, the second very large pressure on, on wild rivers in Europe today is navigation. And we saw uh, this short film on the E40 waterway project. Um, another river that is a prime example of that, and I just would like to highlight it, it is uh, very close to where we live here in Berlin. Um, it's the Oder River. It's a free flowing river on a very, very long stretch. Uh, and it is, um, among the rivers that flow in or <laughs> along the German border, the only one that has no dam or weir uh, on the on its mouth. Um, it's a very ecologically very important river, and uh, IGB Berlin is doing a lot of research there and consulting also uh, agencies. And the reintroduction of sturgeon a sturgeon species is happening there. Um, this conflicts with navigation uh, plans that are uh, yeah, a contradiction to, to the idea of, of preserving river dynamics and the interaction of floodplain and, and river. And uh, what I'd like to mention is that there are petitions out there where, where civil society organizations are asking uh, for support. And um, it is 
my belief uh, uh, certainly that the overriding public interest in an area where there is a national park that was created because of the floodplains of this river, uh, the overriding public interest should be the rivers uh, protecting the river's dynamics and uh, 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 natural uh, free flowing condition. Um, this was just to highlight one example where we are struggling, um, but in a way, I would I would rather like to um, uh, hand this this uh, aspect over to uh, Professor Tokner um, and and uh, ask for maybe um, some insight on what are we looking for when we are restoring a river. What are the essential things that need to come back, and and what will trigger the response of the ecological system, uh, hopefully, and um, what would be the guidelines for setting uh, priorities in, in uh, identifying um, restoration projects? Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, I had tried to uh, hand over a question to Professor Tokner, but if that didn't work, um, maybe I would like to hand over to Michael. Okay, uh, we seem to have a uh, technical difficulty here and stuck somewhere. Um, so, Michael, our moderator, are you there? Okay, Michael is not there. Um, uh, Professor Tokner, are you there? Okay. Um, let me check the time. Well, I mean, in a way, um, it seems like I cannot connect to the rest of the panel, and I don't know if I am uh, being heard. If I look at the clock, um, it is 20 minutes past six, and we have a film pending. Uh, that is a phenomenal portrait of a very impressive dam removal project, and it's just 25 minutes long. So I am now in a position where I would just say, let us let us finish this panel. And I would like to thank all the panelists who were there and thank all the audience. Um, I will start the film. It's called The Elwa Undammed, What's a River For? Um, the Elwa dams were taken out uh, four years ago six years ago to be precise and uh it's a very special case um the largest dam removal in uh, history at least as, as far as i'm aware of a river in a national park um that uh, was freed from two dams and it is amazing to see the rebirth of this river and there's enormous scientific uh, expertise also involved in uh, discovering how the recovery is coming along, but it's also a spectacular engineering exercise. Thank you for joining these sessions. And uh, I will start the film now. Thank you and goodbye, everyone. Thank you.
This is where the Klalem people were created. Creator bathed us there. So we are from this river, and it's not just a river to us, it's our very life. We want our damned salmon back, D-A-M-M-E-D. -E My grandfather was a child when the dams were built. He was one of the last of the clowns to see the Alwa River at full production. I've gone up and down this river just about every year since I was a kid. The only thing I remember really about seeing the river the first time is that I was afraid I was going to fall off my dad's back. I was in a backpack. It's pretty intense to be up here working on this project just because this is the river that that made me want it, <laughs> that made me want to be a scientist in the first place. I essentially have a front row seat to the rebirth of the Elwha River. A river is a life-giving place, nurturing ecosystems and civilizations. What's a river for? It's people who decide. This is a story about one such place. Good morning and welcome to Olympic National Park and former Lake Aldwell. For those of you who have not been down here before, right where my finger's at is where we are at. So you can imagine, we had been here, you know, five years ago, for example, we would be underwater swimming. In the far northwest corner of the country, snow-crowned peaks launch a chorus of streams and tributaries. They assemble into a river called the Elwha. The main stem runs 45 miles through Olympic National Park and the home of the Clallam people and past two dams built near Port Angeles, Washington by a Canadian businessman. Thomas Aldwell was clearly a character, kind of a larger than life figure. We would describe him today as a promoter, as a booster. A hundred years ago, Thomas Aldwell and the pioneers, you know, who subdued the wilderness, conquering the last frontier, as he titled his autobiography, saw the value in the transformation of the wild. Port Angeles, when he came in the 1890s, was a, was a little frontier town. He was a man of vision, no question about it. Again, there was a holy fire inside this guy. And he went out and looked around the mountains, and he started thinking, we damned this, we brought the power into Port Angeles, we could have mills, we could have lights 24 hours a day. The culture and the society viewed this new technology called electricity as a means to an easier lifestyle. The motive was obviously to produce power, but there was also motive to produce a profit, and that was really the foundation of what built this little empire here. In the wilderness waters of a steep basalt gorge, workers completed the broad-shouldered Elwha Dam in 1913, and a 210-foot-tall Glines Canyon Dam in 1927. They not only had the adversity and challenges of old technology, but they had in climate weather, the roads and access down into here were very difficult, and they had to take an incredible risk to build this project. Suddenly, the Elwha was no longer a wild stream crashing down to the strait. The Elwha was peace and power and civilization. My name is Adeline Smith. Shashko is my native name. I was raised by the Elwha River. The King Salmon was, uh, I don't know how tall I was, but it was just as tall as me. <laughs> we were prepared to eat any time we got hungry. My brother used to have a salt shaker uh, hooked down the side of his trousers, you know. <laughs> For millennia, the reliable abundance of fish from the river fueled a civilization. 
The Elwha were one of the most sophisticated and complex hunter-gatherer cultures in the world. If you have full-time artists, then you're not having trouble feeding people and you're not having trouble keeping a roof over people's heads because they can afford to do that art. As Europeans arrived, their diseases decimated the native population. For those who remained, a new crisis emerged. My elders used to sit by the river and talk about how the dams was going to destroy the, the fish. And we watched the salmon. They struggle. They come up to the base of the dam and power plant down there. And uh, they want to come upstream. And they want to do what they were designed to do. And you could literally see them try and get past Elwha Dam, trying to get upstream to spawn where they historically used to go. Salmon were prevented from reaching 90% of their habitats. In a river that once generated 400,000 fish a year, numbers plunged to about 3,000. Some species were added to the endangered list. There's no question that time has sort of caught up to these dams. You know, what's the price that's been paid for putting these dams in? People started thinking about that. I found stories back in 1976 that this newspaper did. We could fill up Lake Aldwell with our stories, I think. Elwha Dam had never been federally licensed to operate. Glines was due for renewal. We were going to have to spend a tremendous amount of money on doing the things that were going to be necessary to get the projects relicensed. We were going to have to provide fish passage, which is extremely expensive. You come to the realization, we can't afford this for the size of these projects. The small amount of energy they produced was enough in the early 20th century, but a fraction of what a single modern mill needed. And just above the dams, a one-of-a-kind opportunity awaited. Olympic National Park, established in 1938 for its special values to the American people, held nearly all of the Elwha River in pristine condition, but idling and impoverished without its salmon. We put everybody in a room and began to negotiate what were people's problems and how could we overcome those problems. You know, you pass a law on taxes. Well, you know, taxes come and go. You return a river to being a wild and free-flowing salmon stream that lasts forever. Nobody's going to repeal that. Nobody's going to build another dam here once these dams come down, that's for sure. This is the largest dam removal ever attempted in American history. After nearly two decades of planning, negotiation, and funding, a $325 million restoration project. Will it work? It begins with an ending. Okay, now we're uh, gonna shut generator two down. Generator two offline. It's kind of like saying goodbye to an old friend. We are shutting everything off in one day. And to do that, there means to be a specific sequence because most of the stuff here is manual. It's not automatic. Okay, we're bringing the load down right now. You guys ready? Here we go, John. Okay. 919. Elwha is put to bed. Hundreds arrive from around the country to celebrate. Tribal members, officials, political leaders, river advocates, and a parade of cameras. So this is truly a historic event. Uh, the largest dam removal in the United States. It's something that our children won't ever forget. And our elders are here to witness it. This is a story of persistence. It's a story of of resilience, of people, of those fish that are waiting right down below the dam. 
excavators lean into the first bite of an 80,000 ton concrete meal. The start of a step-by-step -step process. At Lower Elwha, once spill gates are gone, workers push the river from one side to the other, creating dry access. A demo team blasts temporary passage into bedrock, draining Lake Aldwell by half. After they demolish a four-story concrete plug, the Elwha returns to its original channel. The temporary passage is filled and the site is restored. At Glines Canyon Dam, contractors on a floating barge hammer away at the 21-story monolith, draining Lake Mills in stages. When the lake level is too low for maneuvering the barge, a series of blasts shatters remaining concrete for removal. When we looked at how to take these dams out, the structures themselves are pretty straightforward. The big issue was what do you do with all that sediment? The dams hold back what erodes from the mountains. Enough sand, gravel, and stone to fill the Empire State Building about 18 times. Physical removal? Too costly and impractical. Planners decided to let the river do the work. What's the depth rating right here? The way that we have the boat set up today is to monitor the elevations of the channel and the position of it. We expect that a lot of things will change once the sediment from the reservoirs is released and starts moving downstream. The dams have been storing all of that sediment up into the reservoir pools and none of that's been allowed to come down into the rivers and make the wonderful habitat that we need for the fish. This is essentially a giant uh, supply of salmon habitat just waiting to work its way downstream. Below the dams, the river is starved of the material salmon need to build their nests, called reds, for spawning. And the beaches themselves are almost entirely all cobbles. There's no longer any clams or marine life on the beaches because of the lack of sediment transport. But project managers face a dilemma. About half of the sediment is tiny particles too much at the wrong time would be a suffocating danger to fish. Well, we basically can only control the amount of sediment being released while the dams are in place. How can we allow the river to erode that material downstream while protecting the fish that we need to restore? Years of research provided the answer. A 36-month effort to remove each dam from the top down in stages with pauses for salmon migration and time for the river to digest the sediment moving it gradually towards the coast. Water does not like being impounded. You know, water's purpose is to erode the planet to the oceans. At the lower dam, demolition experts prepare to nudge that process with about 8,000 pounds of high explosives. We can't break the laws of physics. We just try to bend them to our will is we have to shoot a channel about 30 feet deep in order to divert the river. This shot's designed to break the rock without throwing it. We're trying to scramble a bunch of eggs here without making a big mess. About eight miles upriver, Glines Canyon Dam is newer, stronger, and more resistant to removal. The dam is not coming down without a fight, but we're winning. In the tight vise of the canyon, crews employ a pneumatic hammer from a barge tucked against the lip of the dam. This is the coolest job I've ever had. Because <laughs> you're sitting on a waterfall, literally. I mean, one step and you're on top of it, and two steps you're over it, and you're hammering on what's saving your life. You know, it plays a little mind tricks with you. The barge is kept safely in place with a pair of steel columns extending 20 feet below the water line. You're doing it by braille. Everything's underwater. All you're looking at is water going over the waterfall and you're chipping the dam out underneath it. And every day, you can see the lake behind you had went down three to six inches, foot some days. 
As the dams grow smaller, the reservoirs behind them are also in retreat. What we're standing on now is essentially the area that was about 30 feet underwater uh, when the lake was at full pool. And we're standing on between six inches and a foot of fine sediment that was deposited as the reservoir was drawn down. This whole surface is a, is a rapidly evolving landscape and every movement of the river uncovers something that you haven't seen before. An emerging forest of stumps reveals the work of loggers and hand tools. This is one of the big floodplain cedars that was cut down to make way for the reservoir. Um, you can see the steps that they cut to get up to their springboard notches there. Wonders unveiled like the evidence of 2,000-year-old trees removed a century ago, will soon be hidden again. It's pretty amazing how fast the plants are growing on the reservoir. We have waist-high alders and willows already. Next year, these will be above my head. This moss is pretty much always the first thing that you see growing, and then the seeds take hold in the little microclimate that that creates. Scientists are also sowing seeds for one of the largest restoration efforts in Park Service history. We're doing a lot of things really just to try to get nature kick-started. Over the seven years that we'll be doing this project, we'll be installing more than 400,000 plants. The seeds come from the Elwha. Some of the plants take up to two to three years before they're ready to be outplanted. Volunteers help these green shoots reclaim over a square mile of the most unforgiving lands, suffocated by reservoirs and transformed to barren moonscape. You don't have developed soils. You don't have any living vegetation. You don't have any biological legacies. Crews test dozens of native species in search of resilient pioneers that can take root as a major restoration milestone approaches. The lower dam is nearly gone, but for a last plug of rocks and concrete that crews peel away from the Elwha's path. On this festive 4th of July, the river's renewal is another reason for celebration. It's a once in a lifetime event, something that most of us never thought we would see. I think one of the hardest things for people is to imagine a world that's different than it is right now. All the big decisions, all the big political and economic decisions which fundamentally drive our culture, arise from natural resource issues. Bruce Brown's book, published in 1981, inspired people to reconsider the Elwha River. The community of Port Angeles made its decisions a hundred years ago on the dams based on the belief systems that were current then, and based on the knowledge that they had then, our belief systems are different. And I find that gratifying. I think it's crucial, not just here, but for this country as a whole. Bruce hasn't had a reason to return for more than three decades, until now. The sound of flowing water is clearly audible from here. Wow. What a sight. The thing I have never seen in my life is a free-flowing river above the dam. And there it is. I think that's one thing you can see written on this river. A change that is born of changing circumstances and information that has been learned over the last century. Things we know now that we didn't know before. Transformation is also happening below the waterline as fish venture past the vanished footprint of the lower dam. One of the major questions attached to dam removal is how many adult salmon will return to the Elwha. So we're using sonar and it's counting the number of adults, specifically steelhead and chinook that are swimming up the river. You can think of it kind of like a flashlight of sound going into the river, except it's actually 96 flashlights highly focused. So we get sort of movie-like imagery, if you will, of these fish swimming by. The next time Chinook salmon enter the river, they'll have access to the entire watershed. They'll be able to swim right through glines and recolonize the entire river the way it was historically over 100 years ago. Elwha Chinook were among the largest of their kind in the world, up to 100 pounds. Like all salmon, they begin life nested in river gravel. Fragile eggs, thrumming hearts. Young fish make for the Pacific 
tails first and eyes upstream, as if to memorize the way back. Their bodies endure profound changes as they move from fresh water to salty ocean, where they gain most of their weight before coming home to spawn and replenish a hungry watershed. That's what we're waiting for. That's what we've been waiting for lifetimes for. That's what everybody's been excited about to see in this whole project. Scientists expect salmon's return to the Elwha's far reaches will jumpstart the health of its entire ecosystem. There were bears, there were eagles, there were all these critters using this watershed when the salmon went all the way to the headwaters. Salmon are a keystone species. There's studies from the Pacific Northwest that show dozens of different animals that use them. They are the fundamental building blocks of the ecosystem. And on Elwha, when that was taken away, that's when the ecosystem started to crash. Our children are going to see a very different Elwha River than what we see right now. As a demo crew places the last charges into what's left of Glines Canyon Dam, park visitors are a safe distance away to enjoy the making of history. And today is the day that they're doing the final blast. So this is a really exciting day. I'm really happy that you guys are out sharing this experience. and listen to this amazing sound of this beautiful river flowing because it is the first time in a hundred years that you can hear the Elwha River free flowing. We had our last blast on Glines Canyon Dam and so we essentially opened up the river for whatever wants to come up. The river's biggest and most celebrated fish are back already laying eggs for the next generation. Just around the bend from what days before was the base of glides. Today we are doing a spawner survey of this section of the river. We can hear fish excavating their reds. You can hear the splashing as they're moving the gravels. It's really inspiring and humbling to really recognize uh, the power the river has in its own course and in, in its own meaning. In the next 50 years, there's gonna be a brand new forest growing up, new paths for water finding its way off the hill slopes into the river, uh, new places for salmon to spawn. And that's gonna keep me busy just watching the river change for the rest of my life. The waters are different, you know, they're free waters. And the salmon will be able to smell the sweet, fresh water that comes from this river and will follow it and know, you know that they can go all the way to the top. All of a sudden, you're at the headwaters and it's waterfalls and springs coming down the mountainside. You have to go up and look at it. <laughs> it's uh, hard to tell you how beautiful it is. And I can take any person in America and bring them out here to let them stand along the Elwha and get a sense of a deeper current of life, the natural and the perpetual and the forever. What's the river for? It's freedom having the river itself be free as what we're, we're listening to today.